Okay, well, uh, thanks, thanks very, very much to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, different kind of subjects, uh, so different frontier in... Oops. Okay, where did the... Someone offered me another point. This one is... Is it the laser? Oh, it's still there. Okay. All right. Hi, Herman. <laughs> okay, only, only, only the organizers. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, here we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about uh, progress in, in this frontier of gravitational physics, which is quantum gravity. And uh, so, so we like to understand uh, quantum gravity, for example, to, to really understand what are black holes and, and understand the interior of black holes. Uh, and it, maybe even more importantly, to understand what is the Big Bang, theoretically, can, can we understand that? Um, can, can we understand uh, what, happen, what happens uh, to produce structure in the universe? Maybe, maybe understanding dark energy requires some understanding of quantum gravity. Um, and what I want to talk about is some um, very exciting progress um, in a particular approach to quantum gravity, which is the holographic approach, or the ABS-CFT correspondence. Um, what's happened, uh, I would say, in the last 10 years, is it, it's, it's been accelerating, especially in the last five years, um, is an extremely exciting convergence of, of two fields, one of them quantum gravity, and the other one quantum information theory. And actually, as you'll see, it's not just quantum gravity that is being linked to quantum information theory. It's even classical gravity. And, and that, that'll end up being um, most of the focus of what I'll tell you about. So I'm going to remind you about this holographic approach, uh, the, the ADS-CFT approach to defining quantum gravity. Um, and it's really bizarre. Uh, so the basic idea is that the physics of quantum gravity, at least in asymptotically ADS space times, is equivalent to the physics of a very ordinary kind of uh, non-gravitational system. A system that you can imagine is a, fits inside a box here. And um, so suppose I want to think about describing 3 plus 1 dimensional gravity, including quantum mechanics, um, in a space-time that's asymptotically global ADS space-time. Okay. Well, the statement is that then that physical system is entirely equivalent, or perhaps even defined, by some two-dimensional ordinary quantum system that we can think of as a spherical shell of some exotic material. And how does, how does this work? So the basic idea is that we imagine the spherical shell is uh, an ordinary system obeying Schrodinger equation, and we have a Hamiltonian that is, uh, that is known, and that's the Hamiltonian uh, of something like an ordinary quantum field theory, one typically with many degrees of freedom. And the, the idea is that the physics of this system encodes the physics of our gravitational system which lives in some higher dimension. And so we can, there's some identification between the boundary geometry of this system and the geometry of, of this uh, system on the left. Okay, so we're talking about a spherical two-dimensional two -dimensional sphere here, and then this is some three plus one dimensional space time. And so as examples, the idea is each different quantum state of our ordinary quantum system would encode or correspond to some particular space-time in the gravity system. So if I have my ordinary quantum system, this ball, and I go to the very lowest energy possible state, then this somehow encodes empty antidissider space-time. Okay. If I add a little bit of energy to this system over here, maybe by, by tapping it, uh, having some wave excitations in this system, um, that would correspond to adding a little bit of uh, a few excitations in the gravitational system. So now perhaps we have gravitational waves, a few gravitational waves on top of empty ADS space. If we want to describe uh, what happened in the previous talk in this context, 
then the idea would be on the gravity side, we could have some black holes that might be rotating around each other and eventually merging and producing gravitational radiation. And in the conventional system, this would simply look like, um, again, the, the sphere, but now we have energy and various degrees of freedom of our quantum system, and this is moving around in some way, and this somehow encodes uh, the entire physics of the merging black holes, and kept including any possible quantum effects. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is totally bizarre. We'd like to understand how, how can this work? How can space-time geometry be encoded in some lower dimensional system? Why does this gravitational physics emerge from the physics of this ordinary quantum system? And the recent exciting progress suggests that to understand the answer to these questions, um, one needs to think about the physics of quantum information. One needs to understand the ordinary quantum system in the way that a quantum information person would understand that. And these ideas actually are not completely new. They go back to some of the very interesting ideas that emerged in the 1970s connecting gravitational physics to thermodynamics. So I'll remind you that uh, in the early 1970s, Beckenstein and Hawking uh, noticed, and others noticed, that if you think about the physics of black holes and classical gravity, that the area of event horizons um, has properties that are very similar to the properties of entropy in thermodynamic systems. For example, if we have classical dynamics of black holes, then the area of the horizon should increase. Um, and there's also, so that's similar to the second law of thermodynamics. There's also a black hole first law. If we, if we add some uh, energy, which increases the mass of the black hole, then there's some proportionate increase in area of the black hole. So, in the modern context, if we, if we think about uh, how all of this would be described in this ADS-CFT approach, then we can actually understand these results of, of the 1970s. And so the idea is that if we want to describe, say, a single large black hole in ADS space, then the way that that is described in the ordinary quantum system is just some, uh, some very high energy state, or that the simplest thing we can consider is simply taking our ordinary quantum system, putting it in an oven to a very high temperature, and then this thermal state of our, of our system uh, corresponds to the black hole. So energy on one side is more or less energy on the other side. Okay. So now how does this uh, explain the connection between black hole dynamics and thermodynamics? So the idea then is just that part of this dictionary um, suggests saying how the physics of the gravitational system would be encoded in the ordinary system. Uh, part of that dictionary says that the area of the black hole horizon on this side actually is identified with the entropy of the quantum system on the left side. Okay. So if this, is, if this is simply part of how the encoding works, then it's, it's manifestly true that horizon areas should obey laws of thermodynamics because the horizon area of the black hole is, through this fundamental description, uh, corresponding to the entropy of, of our system. Okay, so that's, that's our starting point. Let me just be a little bit more detailed, uh, remind you um, specifically how we think about entropy. So, Entropy is, often we think about it as a thermodynamic quantity. Um, we can actually give a more general definition of entropy um, that applies even in non-thermodynamic systems. Let me start by reminding you of just uh, the way we think about the thermal state of, of a quantum system. So we think of this as being some ensemble of energy eigenstates with associated probabilities given by the Boltzmann weights. And then, when we want to calculate the entropy, we can calculate the entropy directly from those probabilities through this formula. And so, this connection between entropy and area of black holes says that if you have the thermal ensemble um, and you calculate the entropy in this way, 
then that corresponds to some geometrical quantity in the gravity side of the picture in the gravitational system that's being encoded, um, which is the area of this event horizon. Okay. So many of the recent developments have to do with the realization that there are many other entropic quantities that we can define in the quantum system, and that actually all of those have interpretations in the gravitational system as geometrical areas. So I want to, in this slide, I'm going to tell about the uh, generalization of entropy. And so the context here is just to think about any quantum system, not necessarily in a thermal state, just in any state. Um, I want to think about any quantum system with many different parts. And I want to remind you about how uh, any subsystem of such a system um, would have uh, a natural entropy that we can define. Okay, so here's a, an example of quantum system. It's a little bit simpler than our, our, our spherical shell. Um, this is just, say, a bunch of spins. And we can imagine that the whole system is in some particular pure quantum state. Okay. And now I want to focus on some arbitrary subsystem. For example, the collection of these two spins. Now, one of the important things where quantum mechanics differs from class classical mechanics is that if I want to describe the physics of a subsystem of a quantum system, um, then there's no single quantum state that would be sufficient to do that. Okay, so if I want to ask um, what is the physics of just these two spins, there's no state of this form, so this would be the most general state of two spins in isolation. There's no state of that form that generally would uh, have observables matching the state of those two spins in this larger system. Okay. Instead, what is required to describe the state of a subsystem of a quantum system is this idea of an ensemble. Okay. So if I want to understand all of the information that I can understand about those two spins, um, then instead of specifying a single state like this, what I need to do is specify uh, a collection of states. We can take these to be orthogonal, and then an associated collection of probabilities. And then it's always possible to give such an ensemble, to find such an ensemble, so that measurements, uh, ensemble average, uh, averages of measurements um, in this system would match measurements of the subsystem of the entire system. Okay. Um, and so you'll notice that then the description of subsystems of quantum systems, uh, part of that description is a set of probabilities. Okay. So the idea of the ensemble here is very much like the idea of the thermal ensemble, except that in that case the probabilities took specific values, and in general we can have um, uh, many more possibilities. And so it's actually natural when we think about having a quantum system, if we look at a subsystem, then there's actually uh, a very natural entropy that we can associate to such a subsystem. We just look at what is the ensemble describing the subsystem, and then using those probabilities, we use the regular formula for entropy, and then this defines the subsystem entropy for the quantum system. And we had no assumption that anything was in a thermal state. This could be in any arbitrary state. Now, the subsystem entropy also quantifies what's known as the entanglement between the subsystem and the rest of the system. Um, and so sometimes it's called entanglement entropy. And so let me just give you, uh, tie that into maybe uh, a simple example that you would have seen in, uh, in the context of entanglement. Okay. So let's again think about now just a system where the whole system is just two spins. And uh, so I want to point out that we can have states where each spin is in a definite uh, quantum state, so here's up and down. And in this case, the ensemble describing, say, the first spin would just be up with probability one. Okay, the entropy there is zero. And we would say that this spin is not entangled with this spin. On the other hand, if you have uh, a system like this, okay, this is, for example, the state of the electron and proton spins in the lowest energy state of a hydrogen atom, well, in this case, there's no uh, single quantum state that accurately describes the state of the first spin. If we want to say, what is the state of the first spin, uh, we need to say that it, it is in an ensemble where it's up with probability one half and down with probability one half, and then the entropy evaluates the log two. 
And the fact that this is not zero is one definition of uh, what we mean by the fact that these two spins are entangled. Okay, so we would say uh, the subsystem is entangled with the rest of the system if it has a non-zero entropy. Okay. So the main point of this slide is just that the idea of entropy, which was important in uh, connecting black hole areas uh, to thermodynamics, um, it's, it's much more general. We can define an entropy for any subsystem of any quantum system in any state. And that entropy, um, in, in terms of quantum information theory language, we would say that entropy quantifies the amount of entanglement between the subsystem and the rest of the system. OK, so let's go back to this ABS-CFT description of gravitational systems. We remember that in a thermal state that corresponds to a black hole, we said that the entropy of the entire system corresponded to the area of the horizon of the black hole. Okay. Now we've understood that there are many other entropies that we can talk about. So for example, we can consider the entropy of this subsystem of our ball uh, inside that spatial region here. And Ryu and Takenagi, about 10 years ago, made a proposal that any such entropy also has a geometrical interpretation. That there's some surface in the associated space-time um, whose area corresponds to the entropy in, in this uh, related quantum system. Okay. Uh, and I'll tell you what that surface is in a moment. Uh, the other important thing that Ryu Takinagi realized is that we don't have to be looking at a thermal state of our, of our system. We don't have to be looking at uh, a black hole in the gravity side of things. There's still an area entropy connection even for any state of the CFT. So it could be the state corresponding to the vacuum, to the empty ABS, or the gravitational waves, or in this case, the rotating um, black holes. So let me remind you how this works. So imagine psi is the state of our auxiliary uh, quantum system that corresponds to this gravitational physics here. And then we look at the state psi at some particular time, and we ask, um, what is the description of this subsystem, this spatial region on the ball? Okay. There'll be some ensemble of quantum states that describes that subsystem. And we can calculate the entropy of that ensemble. <laughs> and now, Ryu and Takinagi's formula suggests that in the gravitational system that is being encoded by this state, that entropy corresponds to the area of the surface which extremizes the area functional. So here's, here's the surface in, in the, in the space-time. Um, and this surface extremizes the area functional in this space-time, um, subject to the boundary conditions that it encloses the same, you know, the analogous area at, inf at the celest boundary of the celestial sphere. Um, so, so this area on the boundary has the same shape as this area on our ball. Okay, and we could, we could consider some other region, and then we would have some other surface. So, um, so I pick a region, I look for the extremal surface whose boundary agrees with the boundary of that region, and then the formula of Ryu and Takinagi says that the area of this surface in this space time that's being encoded is equal to the entropy of that region in the uh, underlying system. Okay. Okay. So, so that's a massive generalization of, of this original idea that a black hole horizon area would correspond to an entropy. And actually, it's very important for understanding this ADS-CFT correspondence because it gives one possible answer to the question of how is a space-time being encoded in a quantum state. So let's imagine that we have a state, a particular specified state of this two-dimensional system. And we want to know, is, there, is that encoding the physics of some space-time? And if so, what is, the, what is the geometry of that space-time? So now we have an in-principle procedure to, to decode this and to answer this question. 
So the procedure is the following. We just imagine looking at all of the possible spatial subsystems of the quantum system living on our ball, and we calculate the entanglement entropy, or the subsystem entropy, for all of these subsystems. And now we ask, is there a 3 plus 1 dimensional asymptotically ADS space-time geometry where the areas of all the extremal surfaces match with the entropies that we just calculated? So mathematically, that's a highly over-constrained problem. In general, if you, if you took a ball of copper and tried to do this thing, you wouldn't find any possible geometry where the areas in that geometry would match the entropies of the subsystems. Okay. So if there actually is some geometry whose areas correspond to the entanglement entropies, then we should be able to, at least in principle, find it um, by, uh, by, by solving this problem. So we calculate the entropies, we just try to find a geometry whose extremal surface areas match with those entropies. And that's uh, represented by this decoder. Here's, here are the entropies, we plug it in, and it spits out a, a space-time geometry. Now, there are some caveats there. Uh, sometimes you have regions of the space-time uh, where none of these extremal area surfaces penetrate, and then those regions can't be encoded, decoded in this way. Okay. But for many space-times, um, there are no such regions. Okay, so this gives us uh, a lot of insight into how this code works, and it suggests that, remarkably, the space-time geometry, even at the classical level, has something to do with the entanglement structure of our auxiliary system. So that's really remarkable because it connects just classical space-time geometry to a very quantum uh, phenomenon, the phenomenon of entanglement. Uh, so that also opens up uh, very interesting research directions. If it's true that space-time geometry in this, in this model, in this way of uh, describing gravity, if it's true that space-time geometry is really just a, a geometrical manifestation of entanglement structure, um, then we can ask, well, is the, is the physics of the dynamics of that space-time geometry, is the gravitational physics also some manifestation of the physics of entanglement in our underlying system. And so one can see very easily that actually we should be able to deduce various aspects of, of the gravitational physics from, um, from thinking about entanglement and quantum information theory. Okay, so, so Einstein's equations are really just some constraints on the possible metrics that are allowed in, in the physical theory. Um, and we have many kind of constraints that exist on the structure of entanglement in quantum systems. And so maybe there's some relation here. Um, so let me give you some very simple examples. Um, so we talked about the entropy of subsystems. In the picture, we, we see three different subsystems. And there are things that one can prove about subsystem entropies uh, for multi-part systems. So for example, if I have subsystem A and subsystem B, then in any allowed quantum state of this, uh, of this theory, then the entropy of subsystem A plus the entropy of subsystem B is always greater than or equal to the entropy of the combined subsystem. Okay, so notice that this definition of entropy is not generally extensive, but it does obey uh, inequalities. So this is called subadditivity of en entropy. This one is called strong subadditivity of entanglement entropy. Okay. And so these things are true for any quantum state of any quantum system. But the interesting thing is that we can translate these things over to a statement about gravity. So if we have some space-time m, which is encoded in such a quantum system in the way that I've described, Okay. Then these inequalities translate to inequalities which govern the areas of possible extremal surfaces in the corresponding space-times. 
Okay. And so, so I might have a space time where I calculate the areas of extremal surfaces and they don't satisfy these inequalities. And then I would say there's no possible way that that space time could be physical, at least if, if this is the right way to, to describe uh, the gravitational theory. So I want to give you a, a, a few uh, more detailed examples of, of these constraints and how we can learn about gravitational physics from some uh, quantum information physics. And so actually I'll start with um, one of the things that, well, we already knew back, back in the 1970s. Um, so I mentioned this black hole first law that if we start with some some static black hole, and, and suppose we throw something into the black hole to increase the mass, um, then there, the increase in mass is proportional to the increase in area, um, and then there's some constant which depends on the surface gravity. Okay. Well, suppose we didn't know that. Um, well, we might deduce it from this, um, from this connection between entropies and areas. Okay. So if we didn't know that, but we knew that um, that we have this connection that, that the gravitational system is encoded in this underlying system, then we could look at what, what properties do we know about entropy in the underlying system. And so one of the first things you learn about entropies in thermodynamic systems is that if you start with a thermal state and then you just perturb the state, um, that the change in entropy is related to the change in energy. So there's actually, what I've written is actually a quantum version of that first law of thermodynamics. Um, we start with a thermal state, and now I allow any perturbation of, this, of the state, um, not necessarily to a nearby thermal state, but to any nearby ensemble of quantum states. Uh, it's, it's easy to show that the, the first law, as I've written it here, still holds. And so then if you were to translate that, um, if you say, okay, now in the gravitational system, we have an identification between that entropy and the area of some black hole horizon, then we would deduce that that black hole horizon area should uh, obey such a, such a law, uh, also remembering the connection between um, energy on this side being equal to energy on that side. Okay, so that's something, well, it, it's amazing we already saw it uh, in, in the 1970s that there's some connection between the first law of thermodynamics and uh, some aspect of black hole physics. Okay. Um, so remember, many of the recent developments came from going from this global notion of entropy to, and generalizing it to the entropy of subsystems of quantum systems. Okay. So now I want to ask the question, is there some similar thing we can learn by some more local version of the first law of thermodynamics? So instead of considering the entropy of the whole system, considering the entropy of some subsystem, is there some associated first law of thermodynamics, and can we translate that to a gravitational state? Okay. And so here, what I've drawn, uh, so what I'm going to think about is not starting with a thermal system, but actually starting with the vacuum state of our, of our quantum system uh, described in this, this ball. And I want to think about a subsystem which is ball-shaped, so, so for example, uh, that, that or disk shape, that region uh, at the south pole of the sphere. Okay. And now it turns out that um, in the case of conformal field theories, which are, which are the, the most well understood example where we have a, a dual gravitational system, um, there is actually a first law of thermodynamics that applies in this case. And that says that if I want to start with a vacuum state, and perturb it in any way by some first order perturbation, that I can relate the change in the entropy of that subsystem to the change of the energy density expectation value inside this region. There's some particular wave function here such that the change in the entanglement entropy of the subsystem is just equal to the average, or the weighted average of the change of the stress of the energy density expectation value. And this is something that I can prove about in these quantum systems in conformal field theories. Okay. So now we know that now we want to translate this to the gravity side. So this perturbation of the vacuum state of our field theory 
Well, that should encode some particular perturbation to pure ADS space time on the gravity side. Okay, so ADS plus a perturbation. And this equality here, now it should constrain which of these perturbations are possible. Okay, and the way to understand it is the left side here is how much does the entanglement entropy change compared to the vacuum state? Using our dictionary, that means how much does the area of this extremal surface change when I make the perturbation? The right-hand side involves the local stress-energy tensor expectation value. It turns out that that's directly related to the entropy of an infinitesimal, the expectation value of the energy relative to the vacuum at some point is related to the um, subsystem entropy for a small ball centered at that point. Okay, so the right-hand side actually can be expressed in terms of entropy as well, entropy of, a, of infinitesimal regions. And so this equality is, is saying that these, the entropy of the large system actually could be understood from the entropy of the infinitesimal systems inside. Okay. And now we can translate that using our dictionary to the gravity side. It says the area of this large extremal surface here for any allowed perturbation that can be encoded in this, in this way um, should be related to the area of some extremal surfaces that are, uh, that are living out near the boundary. Okay. Or in other words, the area of this extremal surface should be related, I should, I should be able to calculate it in terms of the asymptotic metric enclosed by that surface. And so that's a property that would be true for some perturbations to pure ADS space-time, but not true for other perturbations to ADS space-time. Okay. And so, so this statement in the CFT should translate into some constraint on which are the physically allowed space-times. Okay. And the interesting thing is, we don't just have one such constraint okay, for a given perturbation here. Um, we can consider this ball-shaped region, but we could consider a ball-shaped region of any size centered at any point and also at any time. So there's actually a, a huge number of these constraints that say, uh, you know, what, what is the entanglement structure allowed on this side? And they would translate into a very large number of constraints that, uh, that tell us about which kinds of space times are allowed on this side. Okay. And the remarkable thing is, if, if one analyzes what are all these constraints telling you, it turns out that um, after some mathematics, which is basically Stokes' theorem, you can show that the full set of these constraints that come from this CFT entanglement first law um, correspond exactly to Einstein's equations linearized about the um, anti sitter space. And so, at least at this linearized perturbative level, um, one, we, one has understood the emergence of Einstein's equations as um, coming from some particular constraints on entanglement entropy in quantum systems. Okay. So subsequent to that, um, some of us have looked into whether this can be extended to uh, the nonlinear order on the gravity side. Can one actually understand um, the, the nonlinear aspects of Einstein's equations as emerging somehow um, from constraints on entanglement in quantum systems? Okay. And it turns out that um, that, uh, that program has been successful up to second order. And so, so let me uh, describe a particular result. And at, at this point, I want to emphasize that this result that I'm going to describe um, makes no assumptions about this ADS-CFT correspondence or string theory or any of the background. The result that I'm going to describe is uh, a statement that we can prove about entanglement entropies in conformal field theories. Okay. And so the statement is that if you... Um, so, so what we've done is we've identified a natural class of states within the conformal field theory. So an interesting aspect of this correspondence is not all of the states of this auxiliary quantum system have a nice interpretation in terms of classical geometry, only a subset. And we've identified which is a good subset to look at if one wants a nice classical description on the gravity side. 
within this particular subset of states um, of a general conformal field theory, um, then we can, turns out for this subset, calculate the entanglement entropy for subsystems in terms of local quantities like the expectation value of, this, of the energy density um, and the expectation value of other local operators. Okay. And then what, what one can prove after, after making this calculation of what the entanglement entropy can look like in one of these conformal field theory systems, one can prove that um, once you calculate all those entanglement entropies, that any metric any space-time geometry whose extremal surfaces would match that entanglement entropy must satisfy Einstein's equations up to second order. This is the order that we're working on this side. Up to second order um, with some matter determined by these one-point functions of local operators in the CFT. Okay. So it says that even if, if you're just interested in the physics of entanglement and conformal field theories, that there's, a, there's a, a geometrical, within this, with this particular class of states that we've identified, there's always a geometrical way to represent that entanglement entropy, and that ge those geometries that are relevant satisfy Einstein's equations of the second order. Okay, so somehow, the nonlinear physics of gravitation at the classical level can be understood as being relevant or as, as governing um, the physics of entanglement in quantum systems. Okay. So in the last five minutes, I'm going to tell you about some things that we can learn about gravity that we didn't already know. So of course, it's, it's exciting to have um, a different viewpoint on the origin of gravitational equations um, but there's a potential here to learn a lot of new things um, that were not previously understood um, using general relativity or using um, uh, uh, conventional approaches to gravity. Okay. So as I mentioned, there, there are many, many constraints that people have understood about the behavior of entanglement in quantum systems um, and just in, in general um, other, sorry, other properties um, so again, I'm going to start with something that we did know about gravitational systems, and then I'll tell you about how it generalizes um, to something that we didn't previously know. <coughs> okay. Oh. Uh. Fine. Okay. So, so the, the thing I want to start with is uh, a totally obvious statement in quantum mechanics. So we have an ordinary quantum system here. It has a Hamiltonian. There's a vacuum state, which is defined to be the lowest energy state of that Hamiltonian. And a total, totally obvious statement that I can make about the system is that for any other state, psi, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is going to be greater than or equal to the um, expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the vacuum state. This is just the definition of the vacuum state. Okay. So relative to the vacuum state, the energy is always positive. So this suggests if this quantum system encodes the gravitational physics of some theory of gravity in asymptotically empty to sitter space times, this suggests that if I look at any asymptotically ADS space time other than the pure asymptotically ADS space time, the pure ADS space time, um, there should be some notion of energy that I can define um, for such space times such that that energy is always positive. Okay. And of course we do this. This is the contents of, uh, of the positive energy theorem, or at least the ADS version of the positive energy theorem. So that follows from some really trivial property of quantum systems. Let me give you a, now a local version of that. Okay, so, so again, we can go from thinking about the entire system to thinking about a subsystem. Um, now, there's, there's actually not, for, for subsystems of quantum systems, um, of these quantum field theory systems, um, the ordinary energy of the subsystem is not always positive in a quantum field theory. It's well known that you can have locally um, negative energy densities. Um, but it turns out there is a quantity which is always positive uh, that's, that's more like, like a free energy. And so, so this, this involves, relative to the vacuum state, 
the uh, a certain notion of energy for the subsystem. Okay, it's, it's the same thing that came up. Uh, sorry. Okay, the same the same weighted average here of the local energy density. Um, so that thing. Now, if I look at a state which is not necessarily a perturbation of the vacuum, it could be it could be uh, some. Oops. Okay. Running out of time. Uh, so this could be a state that's far from the vacuum state. Um, any state, if I look at how much that energy changes relative to the vacuum, and I subtract how much the um, entropy of that subsystem changes relative to the vacuum, then this combination is always positive. Okay. So that's, the, that's in, in quantum information language, that's called the positivity of relative entropy. And since for any state and any such ball-shaped subsystem on the quantum side, um, there, there exists this positive quantity, um, well, we could ask, well, what does that correspond to on the gravity side? It suggests there should also be some quantity on the gravity side, which I can define, and which should always be positive for um, any allowed space time. Okay? And in fact, um, that, th this, uh, it's possible explicitly to understand what this quantity is. Um, so we've recently written down, um, I guess, one could call it something, something like a positive energy theorem for gravitational subsystems that says that if I have a consistent uh, space-time that's asymptotically ABS, um, there's not just a statement that the, that the energy of the whole space-time has to be positive. Uh, there are actually energies that I can associate to various subsystems that are contained inside these extremal surfaces. And all of these kinds of energies must be positive. Um, just, just to, to give you uh, an idea of what are we talking about here. So, so that, that was a previously unknown definition of gravitational energy. If we go to the limit where we're close to pure ADS, um, then this energy that we've defined reduces to something that was known previously. Um, it, it's just like what's known as a canonical energy associated with... Um, with um, certain Riddler patches of ADS space-time. Um, so, yeah, so, 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 so if, if this is the ball-shaped region of my CFT, um, there's some associated Riddler patch in ADS that in pure ADS there's some uh, isometry that, um, whose associated killing vector um, lives in this region and vanishes at the boundary. One can use that killing vector to find an energy. So that's a perturbative energy that one can define um, near ADS, um, but it, we have a definition that extends this to arbitrarily asymptotically ADS spacetimes, and then the suggestion based on quantum information theory is that that energy must always be positive. Okay, so it's a, some infinite new family of possible positive energy theorems um, that one could now try to prove in GR, um, maybe starting with a null energy condition. Okay, so the summary of this talk is that in this approach to defining quantum gravity, um, in this holographic approach, then we have some remarkable connection between even classical gravity and the physics of quantum information. The suggestion is that in this way of defining the gravitational system from an auxiliary quantum system, the space-time geometry is really just a geometrical picture of the structure of entanglement in the quantum system. And we've seen that Einstein's equations at least up to second order, can be derived um, directly from constraints on entanglement in the auxiliary quantum system. And we've actually also seen that certain new results of gravitational physics, even classical gravitational physics, are suggested by this connection to quantum information theory. Okay. And so I'd like to say that this, is, this has been um, uh, almost a, a fantastic plot twist uh, where Originally, we started out with a very difficult problem of fitting gravity into the framework of quantum mechanics, but then somehow, uh, in the end, it seems that even classical gravity um, is, is just quantum mechanics um, looked at from a different perspective. Thank you. Group discussions. Yes, we have some questions over there.
Thanks very much for this nice talk. Um, I mean, in the middle of the, towards the end of the talk, you pointed out that some of those results really did not need ADS-CFT or string theory or anything like that. That was just properly the formative theory. And that is something that we see in other approaches also. And this is something that, for example, Rob Myers and Eugene P. Yankee, the architecture of space science, has spelled out. Very and so, look on Kyle, the Yankee has shown that uh, basically entanglement, entanglement properties of certain, certain states, like a preferred state, just like what we have, uh, they really have to do with the classicality of Kyle and so on. So, my question was really it seems that it's very artificial to sort of embed all these in the HFCFT, especially the negative version of constant. Because if in fact, these things were well, some fundamental things, entanglement properties of quantum systems having to do with classical gravity. Surely they must extend also to negative cosmology, a positive cosmology constant, zero cosmology constant. And in the beginning, of course, with the ADS state came, you can hope that all these things will be generalized quickly, but that doesn't happen. So, come, so to me, this is somewhat very artificial to embed this something which is much more general in the ADS state context. And I just wanted to have your views on this. Thank you. So that's a very good question. Um, and actually, my view is that, you know, the, the question you, you ask, how, how do we go beyond this kind of artificial, asymptotically ADS case? Of course, this is it's probably the most important question that we can that we can try to answer going forward in this in this field. And to me, actually, the, the we didn't really have anything to work with for a while, but to me, actually, this connection between the entanglement structure and the space-time geometry, uh, I, th I think we can utilize that. So if, if, one, if one believes, as you say, that this should extend to more general situations, and, and I agree, it's, it would be uh, crazy if it's only specific somehow to, uh, we, already, we already know that there's some connection between, uh, between entropies and, and gravity and other contexts. Um, and so, so I think what, what we can hope to do now is, is take it seriously, say, you know, say I wanted to find, describe the sitter space time or, or some FRW space time. Now look at the, look at the extremal surfaces uh, in that space time. Um, look at how they fit together and say, is there some kind of quantum system where the entanglement structure of that other quantum system, maybe it's not a CFT, maybe it's some, something more general. Um, can, can, can we find uh, quantum systems to reproduce the entanglement structure, the, the, whose entanglement structure reproduces sort of the space-time geometry in these more general contexts? Thank you. So there was another question, yes, over there. Hi, thank you for the uh, very nice talk. <coughs> I wanted to ask uh, about quantum black holes and the information paradox that all seems to disappear into the background. Yeah, yeah so this is, um, this is uh, of course, one of the things we can do, even in the context of asymptotically AES space time, is ask interesting questions about, um, about black holes. Um, we had a, a, a big, uh, uh, I guess, five years ago or five or six years ago in this field, there was, there was a great debate about firewalls and whether, whether black holes um, really have smooth geometry behind their horizons typically or, or is there something much more dramatic. Um, but I, I, I think there is quite a bit of ongoing work um, about um, understanding the physics, say, of black holes in, within this ADS-CFT setting. Um, one of the very interesting things here is, is that, um, so I, I mentioned that there are regions of space times where, um, where sometimes the, these extremal surfaces don't penetrate. Um, and uh, I, th I think the viewpoint for, for a while was that, um, that you know, maybe black, black hole interiors um, are such a context where, where even though we might have this way of understanding how the geometry outside the black hole will be encoded in the CFT, um, the, the horizon provides some, is, is maybe a barrier um, that we can't, we can't yet understand how to um, understand the, the physics behind the horizons. Um, I'll just mention some very recent work. I, I had this, uh, this extra slide. Um, I'll just, so, something that we realized very recently along those lines is that um, if you imagine you know, at least certain scenarios for what, what would be behind the black hole's horizon, so maybe a, 
at a particular spatial slice in a black hole space-time. Suppose that I thought that um, spatially the black hole extended past the horizon to some, you know, some end, some kind of inner boundary. Um, this is this is what's indicated in this picture. Um, actually, many of these contexts. Oh, sorry, it's me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to see me. Um, okay. So here's a, here's a picture of a, a possibility. Um, so, so one of the interesting questions is, you know, especially how far does, does the geometry go past the horizon? Surely there's not a second asymptotic region as in the maximally extended geometry if we form the black hole from collapse. Um, so maybe, maybe there's some particular inner boundary at a particular time. Um, so a very interesting point is that by looking at the... Um, that there are certain extremal surfaces that would actually extend past the horizon to this inner boundary. Um, so we've realized recently that um, if, if this is the case, this would correspond to some particular high energy state in, in one of these CFTs. And the physics of the inside of the black hole, um, it turns out if, if, you, if you look at large enough subsystems of this ball, um, then you have the possibility of probing inside the horizon. Um, so I think that's a very interesting direction. Um, so it's relating that interior black hole physics to the, the non-thermal physics of large subsystems of, uh, of sort of black hole microstates. Thank you. We have the last question. So as you know that uh, decoherence and entanglement are the two sides of the same coin. Now imagine if I had to do a reduction experiment, and I wanted to understand the left-hand side of your um, talk. Uh, you had two slides. Two slides. Yes. And I want to open up my system a little bit, because of all the examples you have given, they are all closed systems. Mm -hmm. If I want to open up a system and I want to use sequence, have I got ever any possibility of learning the right-hand side of my geometry from this system? Yeah, so I think actually there, um, I didn't have time to, to get into this. Um, there are very interesting contexts where I can where I can open up this system, um, and I'll just give one example. So I talked about the thermal state of a CFT as being some ensemble. Um, now, in in quantum mechanics, the way that we would think about that is that maybe the CFT would be part of a larger system which includes a heat bath, and and the, the thermal state would just be the subsystem of this larger system. Um, and so we actually understand various ways to um, understand the right-hand side for specific ways of purifying the thermal state. So, so one way would be just have another copy of the CFT, and then there's kind of a symmetrical purification. And that actually is the description of this two-sided, um, maximally extended black hole. Having two asymptotic regions corresponds to having two CFTs. But we can purify it in, that, in this two CFT system in other ways where it's not symmetrical, and then we're starting to understand how this could correspond to having a Schwarzschild exterior in one asymptotic EDS space-time. But then in the other space-time, maybe you have a Schwarzschild uh, black hole, but with some matter falling in. Um, so we're starting to explore this idea of um, you know, how to understand different purifications of a, of a subsystem where, where now our CFT is, is open and it's coupled to some other. I mean, in, the simple, in the cases we understand, then what it's coupled to is just another CFT or some other collection. But this is also an interesting direction. Okay, thank you. So before I close, I've been uh, asked to make an announcement. So the members of the uh, normal distance are so the members of the committee of the society will have now a lunch in the Soroya Palace Hotel, which is nearby. So thank you, Mark, for the talk. Thank you.